I am totally convinced beyond a shadow of any doubt that the best days for me and for you and for Go Church are ahead. I'm telling you, just around the corner, we have some exciting news. I just want you to begin to pray. I just want you to begin to know on the inside, heart, soul, spirit, brain, that good things, man, are coming down the road. God is going to do some amazing things in your family. Start thinking about the next six months as opportunity zone to grow in God, to grow the kingdom. So just get ready and stay tuned. It's going to be exciting times. My wife, Becky, and I, we pastored college students for 14 years before we moved out here to Denver to start Go Church. We love students, love college students. One of the things that I would see students struggle with so many times is pressure. They would have a lot of pressure that they would apply to themselves. They would feel like I've got to get into the right school. Then I've got to get into the right fraternity, sorority, student organizations. I've got to get into the right program, the right degree. I've got to get the right grades. Then I've got to do all of that so I can get into the right med school, get into the right program, get into the right residency, get into the right fellowship, then I've got to specialize. And they're thinking in their mind, if I can just do this and then this and then this and then this, somewhere down the road is this zone that is like a trouble-free, living on top of the mountaintop, peaches and cream, low trouble, low drama, plenty of this, Life and everything will become easier. Well, they go and they go and they go and they get that job and they start making that money and they even pay off their debts and they come to this place where it's like, wait, I thought it would get easier. Like I thought it would become smoother, but it hasn't. And then they can get so disillusioned and confused and it can even roll into their relationship with God. This idea of like, I've got to get to this place in life where it's perfect. Have you ever felt like that? Like if I can just get past this zone, if I can just get through this undergrad, if I can just get through this graduate school degree, if I can just get my PhD done, if I can just get the right first high paying medical job, well, everything's going to be fine. Maybe you apply this to kids. I know I've felt like this a little bit. I've got three of them. It's like, if I can just get past diapers, oh, Jesus, please, please, if I can just get past diapers, if we can just get to the place where they can feed themselves, they don't do anything around the house. These babies don't clean. They don't help. They don't work. All they do is eat and make noise. If I can just get them to talk and then if I can just get them to shut up, everything will be easier. Have you ever felt that way? Like trying to strive for that trouble-free zone, trying to arrive and live permanently at a mountaintop experience. Have you ever strived for that? Maybe you looked for money to help bring that solution or the right relationship or the right job or the right status of life. I want you to begin to explore your heart. It brings us to the one big thing. I want you to write this down. Let's check this out together. I will be victorious in the valley. I want you to think about the valleys being the hard times, the scary times, the times where you feel like you're alone. I will be victorious in the valley. In fact, Jesus says, look, in this life, you are going to have trouble. Expect trouble. And he goes on to say, if you're going to follow me, you can expect double trouble. Now, I want to pause, and I want us to just take this in and digest it. Yes, we are going to have times that are in the valley. We're going to have these trough times. We're also going to have mountaintop times. But this idea of just trying to live and achieve to get to some trouble-free, utopian, mountaintop, 100% living is not going to happen in this life because we're not in heaven yet. But what does that mean? Does that mean that we're doomed to the valley or doomed to pain all of the time? I want you to think about it like this. Even though we hit valleys, We can be reminded of the phenomenal scripture. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with me. 
And if you truly believe that God is with you, any thing can happen. I'm telling you, if you feel like you're in a valley right now, remind yourself that God is with you. You're not in that valley alone. God will provide. He is your protector. He is with you. He's never going to kick you to the side. Come on, do you believe that? Even in the valley of the shadow of death, God is with you. See, that's the promise. It's not to never walk through a valley. The promise is to always have his companionship. The presence of God with you in the valley is what helps you get through in surmounting challenge, times of hardship, times when you get to dig deep, trust a little more, believe a little more. It's God's presence that gets us through. One big thing, I will be victorious in the valley. Now, in the book of James, why are we talking about valleys? Because in the book of James, he's writing to groups of believers, like you and me, Go Church. He's writing to groups of believers that have been scattered. You see, the early church, think about the mountaintop experience of Jesus being resurrected. Huge mountaintop experience. Ascension to heaven. Hello, Mountaintop, the first church getting started, explosive growth, energy, it's growing. People are excited. Miracles are happening. And then the church begins to encounter persecution and hard times. Stephen, the first martyr, was stoned to death for his faith. The pressure is starting to mount and the believers are scattered. This is a valley time. James is writing to believers in the valley. Hard times tough times. How can you triumph in tough times? How can you have that spirit of victory when you're in the valley? We're going to learn how we can do it in and through James. The people that he was writing to scattered. They were sick. Sound familiar? Pandemic. They were going through economic times. Stock market has been up and down and a little chaotic. Times of economic pressure, political pressure, election. So James is writing to a group of people that were experiencing, in my opinion, much stiffer conditions when it comes to persecution of their faith. But fear is fear. Pain is pain. And God wants to meet you right where you are at. Now, sometimes when we're in a valley, it was the same way here in James, we're going to see this. When you're in a hard time, sometimes our initial reaction in the flesh You know, the selfish part of us, the part that just kind of wants to look after ourselves is exactly that. In times of trouble, when you're in the valley, sometimes the temptation is like, just focus on myself, my stuff, okay? If we're feeling like, I don't know if there's going to be an abundance of food for everyone, this is mine. I'm not giving anybody a piece of this pizza. All of these pizzas are mine. This is my money, my house, my time, my talent, my treasure, my money, my stuff. I'm keeping it. I'm hoarding it. I'm holding on to it. And I'm like battening down the hatches because I don't know what's going to happen. Valley time, me, me, me. So James is instructing these believers that are struggling with handling finances in a godly way, and it's become a problem. Be challenged and stirred by what we read, James 5, 3. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. The early believers were struggling in this valley, in this time of persecution, church being scattered, unpredictability, uncertainty. In the middle of that environment, they were clutching, clutching their stuff, my stuff, my time, my money. Now, I think it's interesting that James says that the money itself isn't evil. You don't see that case being built in the Bible that money itself is evil. It's not bad to have money, but it is tragic for money to have you. 
for money to tell you what to do or not do, for your flesh or your selfishness or the fear that you feel to tell you to do or not do. It was the corrosion of selfishness, the hoarding that became cancerous. So I want you to be challenged and stirred by this. Examine your own heart. Are there areas in your own life right now that in the middle of this pandemic and changing times and new job and new stuff and man, new commutes and new relationships, are you turning inwards? Letting your feelings rule you. Are you clutching? Are you hoarding? You see, hoarding and clutching is not the way that you move forward out of the valley. You don't hoard your way out of a valley. You give your way out of the valley. And that's one of the things that we decided to do as a church in the middle of this pandemic. We just decided, you know what? As a leadership team, we are not going to stop supporting missions we are not going to stop supporting our missionaries. We are not going to cut back their support. In fact, during the last six months, we have built three buildings, church buildings in Kenya to teach kids, to provide food for orphans, teaching, health care. Those buildings went up. We talked about that on a Facebook Live event. We have given to our missionaries in a consistent way. We've continued our partnership with our ministries in the Five Points area, Urban Outreach, Sox Place, downtown. We haven't pulled back. We have pushed in, and I am challenging you. I'm just going to get up in your business. And I want to challenge you enough because I love you enough to do it and let God stir you. If you have pulled back, if you have pulled back from generosity, it is time to change directions. It is time to get irrational with your generosity, to trust God when culture says no, to trust God when your flesh says no, to trust God and to give, give irrationally, give consistently, give your way out of the valley. Don't allow money to have you. James gives us such a powerful challenge in that. Don't clutch it. Open up your hands. Open up your hands to give. Open up your hands to receive from God. James continues. We're in chapter 5, verse 13. Again, talking to the scattered church under pressure in the valley. Listen to these encouraging words. Is anyone among you in trouble? I think some of us would say, yeah. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Let's say those three words together. Let them pray. One more time. Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered up in faith, there's prayer again. And the prayer offered up in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed, restored. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being. Even as we are, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. How can we live a victorious life? How can we say I will be victorious in the middle of the deepest, darkest hardest valley of the shadow of death. One of the things that you've got to build into your life, almost like muscle memory, is our one big action. Our one big action, I want you to write this down and I want you to begin to apply it, do it. This is, this is take action time. This is not just like, oh, take a note and forget about it. This is what we are all going to do, including myself, this week. Write this down. I will pray every day. I will pray every day. I'm talking about like intervals. Now, maybe you've heard of HIT. If you're a workout person, high intensity interval training. Well, we're going to tweak it. I want you to think instead of HIT, I want you to think this week, HIP, high intensity interval praying. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get up in the morning. 
Maybe you're a coffee person like me. And maybe when that cup finishes brewing or you finish up that mocha pot or that Nespresso or espresso or French press, whatever it is you do, by the time you finish pouring that into the cup, it is five minutes of go time. I mean hard intense praying. Maybe you walk up and down in the living room. Maybe you take it to the patio. Maybe you take it down to the basement and you begin to pray for your family. You begin to pray for the ones that you love. You begin to pray things like, my father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you just start praying five minutes hard, then take a rest. Come back to it. Lunchtime. Take five minutes, lunch, before, after. If you're at work, if you're not working at home, maybe if you're at work, maybe you go outside for a minute, find a place, go to your car, take a walk. If you are at home, maybe you go outside, go up and down the sidewalk a couple of times, praying for Go Church, praying for members of Go Church. That is Go Church, the people, praying for me, praying for your pastor, the leaders of this country, praying for a soon coming solution to Corona. Five minutes of intense prank, then take a rest. Then in the evening, maybe you're making your long at home commute. You know, it's been a long day at the office. So you get up from your home office and you make the commute to the kitchen. And maybe between here and there, you take the long way, five more minutes. And you just begin to pray, begin to thank God for what he's done, begin to pray about the day that's to come, the decisions that are to come, praying for a good night's rest for your children, praying for a calm mind for your family. Five, five, five. I'm telling you, five, 10, 15, 20, you start putting all that together and you might not ever pray more than an hour, but you don't go an hour without praying. And you start to build in this muscle memory. Now, I want to give you three types of prayer to make happen in your life. You see, when you pray, you tap into the unlimited power of God. When you try to do life without prayer, you limit yourself to your own self. It's like you build a fence around your life that you can never break out of. But when you tap into the power of God, the person of God, the spirit of God. It is unlimited freedom living. And I'll give you three types of prayer to make happen in your life. The first one is this, write it down. Get some prayer from leaders in your life. Now this is somebody that is just older than you in the faith. You know, maybe they have walked the road of faith a little longer than you. Maybe it's a pastor. Maybe it's a small group leader. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa. Maybe it's somebody that has been a great friend, but they've walked with the Lord a little longer than you. Ask them to pray for you. Say, so would you pray for me for a couple of weeks? Ask them, if you feel like God impresses anything in your heart, would you share it with me? If God puts a scripture in your heart for me, would you share that with me? I would just be so honored if you would pray for me. I'm telling you, God has used mentors in my life in such a powerful, spiritual way. And I want to see that happen for you. Get prayers from leaders in your life. Second thing, prayers for healing. Prayers for healing. Look what James says. We've already read it. Look, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered up in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. I'm talking about healing emotionally, physically, spiritually, relationally. Our God is a God of comprehensive healing power. Pray for healing. Pray for healing of other people in your life. The third one, write it down. Think about it. Prayers for forgiveness. Confessing your sin. James tells us to confess our sin one to another. And you might think, well, why? I mean, I've already asked God to forgive me. Isn't that good enough? It's kind of awkward talking to somebody else about it. I, I might feel a little bit uncomfortable or like, Maybe I don't want to share that stuff with other people because it makes me feel like I'm not as good as maybe I project. We're starting to chip away at the idea of confession is not easy to other people because you can really only do it out of a position of humbleness, humility. You see, when you confess your sins, not only to God, but to other people, you see humility grow. 
You are like fertilizing the fuel of humility. And God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You want grace? Get humble, man. So you see humility grow. You see unity grow. You see trust grow. And accountability starts to happen one person to another that helps make you stronger. Accountability is not a dirty word. It's not a restrictive word. It is a launching pad to freedom. Get some accountability in your life. Pray for forgiveness. Look what James says, 516. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The power of confession, the power of praying for forgiveness is so real. Think about this. How can we achieve victory in the valley. We've learned some powerful lessons from James. First of all, we are never going to hit a zone where we are in this trouble, free, living, mountaintop only experience. Why? Because we are in a broken system. We live in a chaotic world that was broken by sin. We have hope. Jesus is with us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear because he is with me. We've learned that. How can we make this happen? How can we make it happen? I will pray every single day. High intensity interval praying. Five minutes here, five minutes there, five minutes here, five minutes lunch, five minutes evening. I'm telling you, God will make a way for you to grow through any time. And honestly, you'll probably grow the most during the hardest times of your life. In faith, embrace it. You don't have to necessarily look forward to it, but count it joy. Remember, James, count it joy when you face trials of many kinds because good things are going to come out of it. I got a phone call, which turned into several conversations and some text messages exchanged and some appointments made. Wonderful Go Church family. Man, love them to death. Love their kids. (sighs) This precious couple struggling. They're in a valley time. The wife feels like her health is falling apart and she doesn't know why. She's losing weight. She doesn't know why. And they're worried about it. I mean, like crying, worrying about it, heavy, heavy heart, worrying about it. They're in a valley time and we're talking and we're praying. And I send her a book and I talk to him just today. This is Friday that I'm recording this. And we had a great conversation. We prayed together. And in the valley, God is still as real as he is on the mountaintop. And I tried to remind them of that. And as we prayed together, I could just feel the power of the spirit beginning to move. You see, the Holy Spirit is a comforter and a counselor. And maybe you, like this precious Go Church family, maybe you are going through a valley, a tough time. Maybe you have even thought, where is God? God has forgotten about me. I can't see the sunlight. I can't see my way. I'm stuck in this deep, dark valley of shadow. I want to encourage you. Invoke the word of God. Stand on it. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for my God is with me. And if God is with you, anything is possible. Let's pray together. God, we come to you as brothers and sisters and family, your kids. And God, I pray that whoever is watching this right now that's going through a valley time, a tough time, God, maybe they get some bad news. They're struggling with a physical sickness. They're struggling with the loss of a job or just the feeling of potential loss. God, I pray that right now you would remind them that you are with them that your presence is with them through any trial. God, I pray right now, only through the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, that you would just extend comfort, extend strength. Come on, if you're out there and you're watching this, begin to cry out and ask God. Say, God, I need your presence. I want your presence. Remind me of how close you are.
God, I pray right now, companionship, proximity, miracles, healing. I pray for broken bodies to be mended. I pray for broken emotions to be mended and healed. God, I pray for restoration right now in the name of Jesus. I pray and I just rebuke any attack of the enemy right now. And I pray life and I pray freedom. I pray restoration in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. You see, your relationship with Jesus, my friend, is what it's all about. I'm asking you, do you have one? Do you? Not just information about him here, but a knowing in your heart here that you are his child, that you are a follower of Jesus. You see, this is the gospel, that Jesus gave his perfect life for our messed up life, that he gave that perfect life on the cross. And by giving it, he washed away took all the punishment that we deserved on himself and he washed away the penalty of sin for us. How can we know him? The Bible says this, that if we will confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God, resurrected from the dead, we will be saved. And I wanna give you an opportunity to pray that prayer of salvation with me right now. If you wanna make Jesus the Lord and the leader of your life, pray this with me out loud right now. Pray it. Say, Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. I ask that you would forgive me of every sin. I am making you the Lord and the leader of my life, and I'm going to live for you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, let's say our mission. Let's launch out of this time together, saying our mission together. It is right behind me. Come on, say it with me. Our mission is to live local, Go global and live like Jesus. I love you.